Professor Orgelis here. We're actually moving on to lecture number 10. On Friday, we weren't able to have lecture. I actually have some playlists there. It's not the best experience, but you should still go back over lecture number nine. Um, there's actually a special playlist here that's been created. Uh, probably goes over more content than we could have went over in the lecture. So definitely watch this playlist. There's four videos. They're short, maybe 10, 20 minutes um, each video. And it will go over the content more thoroughly than we can go over in the lecture. I'm not sure if it's best to add that to the course playlist or just have this separate playlist here. I can add these videos to the course playlist. Uh, I did the same with the intro to JavaFX. I probably need to put it on the Canvas page, but there's actually a separate playlist that I posted in that announcement that goes over into intro to JavaFX. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I can put those in the playlist, but the videos are here. You'll want to watch them for lecture nine. Important content. A lot of students will use this lecture nine for their final project. They'll come back and use an HTML editor or some of these text areas for the final project. So important videos to watch. We're moving on to lecture 10. We're going to go over trans, uh, transitions. There's also a zip file to download. Okay, so go to uh, lecture 10, download the zip, download the slides, load the zip into NetBeans. Okay, load the zip into NetBeans. I'm probably going to go ahead and go over some of the slide material while you're loading the code into NetBeans. And when we're done with the slides, we will go ahead and come right into NetBeans. So we're going to talk about JavaFX animations. We're going to talk about the content needed for the next challenge. Not very many slides here, just some basic background information about animations. If you've taken 2830, you're probably very familiar with animations. Okay, for those of you who are coming in, we're on lecture 10. Download the slides, download the code. We'll be in NetBeans here in a second. So animations in JavaFX can be divided into two things. Okay, you have the timeline and the actual transition itself. This is important because you'll see when we implement it, we actually, we actually have to implement two different objects when creating an animation. So you have your timeline and you have your actual transition. So in general, okay, the animation objects implied some type of illusion or some type of motion on the display. Okay, so it's gonna be rapidly moving on the display to create some illusion like the object is moving or it's in motion or it's twisting. Okay, so the animation will change over time. Okay, so I'm gonna have some node. In this example, we're gonna make some stopwatches, some CPU monitors. So we're gonna have some dial that's moving across the display, changing over time, depending on what the properties are. Now what's nice is JavaFX already provides a library, so we don't have to create this from scratch. And the package contains classes used to animate nodes. Okay, the base, basically animation is the base class of all the classes that we're gonna be using. We also have transitions, so animations, are both the timeline and transitions. Let's break down transitions. So transitions in JavaFX provide a means to incorporate animations into some internal timeline. Okay, you can have multiple animations running in parallel. They have different types. You could do a fade, path, sequential transition. Okay, fade, will usually change the opacity of a node over a given time. Path will move the node from one end to another. And sequential may do several transitions at that given interval. So you can imagine this path transition. So I start here at the beginning. So this entire thing this is going to be my timeline, this entire thing. 
Okay, this backwards S. Here's my first point. That's my first point along the timeline. And let's say I have my square move to this XY coordinate. Second point, move to this coordinate. Third point, fourth point, and so on. So the cube is moving along this timeline at these designated areas. Okay, it's doing this backwards S. When it gets to the end, it could either stop or it could repeat, okay, depending on what you decide, it can repeat. Just keep doing the animation, or it can do it once, stop, maybe go reverse, and then do it again. Okay, it all depends on what you define. Uh, let's see, the timeline will interpolate it, right? So you'd really only need about four to five keyframes to animate in that way. Um, depends on what you're doing. It okay, depends on what you're doing. So you'll see each dot here is a keyframe. Okay, each dot here is a keyframe. So it's going to be defining the entire transition. So I have each keyframe on my timeline and each XY coordinates. I may be rotating the cube as well. Okay, I may be rotating the cube as well. So it depends on what you're building. You may have five, you may have a hundred different keyframes okay and we can do things parallel so we can not only rotate or move in position so you'll see this cube here i'm not only rotating it i'm increasing in size and also increasing in color okay so i'm executing a fade a translate which is moving it a rotate and a scale okay so i actually have four different Transitions being applied at the same time. Okay, so animations are driven by the associated properties such as size, location, color, which you can see here. Those are what we've used. So we use size, location. We're translating the x-axis. We're also rotating it. And then also the color is being modified. So you gotta you gotta update one of these properties. Okay, otherwise it's gonna sit there. I could have a bunch of keyframes. Let's say I have a hundred keyframes, but I'm not updating any of the properties. I may have some animation there, but it's not doing anything. So the timeline is gonna provide the capability to update these property values along the progression of time. Okay, which is your gonna be your keyframe. So I have my timeline, I have my keyframe. So imagine this transition here. I have my timeline that's going to move all the way to the edge of this screen. During the movement, I'm rotating the cube, I'm increasing in size, I'm also changing the color. Okay, so I'm doing the scale, rotate, translate X, and then also fade for the color. So each keyframe along this timeline is going to define what's going to be happening. So the animation state transitions basically on your, on your UI are declared by the start and end. So if you want to make it simple, you could just say start here, end here. The system defines how many keyframes. Or you can say start here and I define each individual keyframe. We also have other actions like stop, pause, resume, reverse, and repeat the movement. Okay, so here's a basic timeline again. Let's say I have this uh, rectangle here. We're gonna move it from X just to 300. So we're animating this object horizontally on the X axis and we're leaving the Y axis unchanged. Now we could increase the Y, maybe we increase the object or we rotate the rectangle as we're moving across. But this would be easy. I could just say start at X100, end at X300 and take 500 milliseconds to do it. Okay, so then it's going to Start at 100, 300, it'll 
divide the keyframes automatically based off of how many milliseconds you, you specified, and it'll move the object accordingly. Okay, so remember, there's two things here. We have our timeline, we have our keyframes, and that actually matches with this first slide. So I said there's a timeline and then there's the actual transitions. In JavaFX, it's gonna be your keyframe and your timeline. So a timeline is individual keyframes sequentially in order specified by time. Okay, so you're gonna either define one or more keyframes. The keyframes are usually target values. What's gonna happen at that point in time as we're interpolating along the timeline? Okay, we also have to and from values. We don't have to specify every keyframe. I could say uh, from 100 pixels, go to 300 pixels. But you'll still have keyframes in that scenario. Okay, you'll see a warning here. These are usually good quiz questions. A running timeline is being referenced from the FX runtime. Infinite timelines might result in memory leaks if not properly stopped. All the objects within animation properties would not be garbage collected. Okay, so you have to clear the timeline. You have to make sure it's being stopped correctly. The JavaFX garbage collector will not handle that for you automatically. And I'll show you how to do that in the code. Let's take a look at the code. Okay, we're gonna be going over the next challenge. So you'll see my stopwatch, I loaded it from the lecture 10. Okay, so download the zip, load it into NetBeans. And let's take a look. So here's what I'm starting with. Okay, I wanna make a stopwatch. I have a little bit of code written for us just to speed things up. Now we were working with a grid pane earlier. And if you go back and watch lecture nine, we also use a grid pane there. I believe there was also a VBox used in one of the lectures on nine. So here's a new, we have the stack pane. Okay, stack pane is gonna be what you think of a stack, basically like a stack of plates. So, Let's say I have two images and I put them in a stack frame, which is what we're doing here. They're gonna be on top of each other. Okay, they're gonna be on top of each other. And basically when I put one on the stop, uh, stack frame, it's gonna be on the bottom. When I put another object on the stack frame, it's gonna be above it. Okay, now when I'm putting images on the view, it's a little bit different. Okay, you would think I just create an image and add it to the, to the view. That's not how it will actually work. In JavaFX, I have an image file, which is actually the file itself. And then if I want it to display on the view, I have to put it in the image view. Okay, so we can do a test here. I have a stack pane. I have an image view. And I have an image. If I run this, Okay, you'll see the stack pane is on the root and the image views are there, dial image, hand image. If I run this, okay, you're not gonna see anything. Okay, we actually might get a compile error here. Let's see, what's it say? Um, invocation exception. Okay, and actually I wanted to show you how to fix this. This is what I call the red wall of death. And you're gonna get this a lot in JavaFX and you're not really gonna know what to do. So look at this error message here. It says application start invocation target exception. Now what you wanna do is look for the class that's yours. Okay, so did I write any code called method.java? If I look over here, I only have one Java file. It's called my stopwatch. I never wrote a launcher. I never wrote method.java, I never wrote launcher, I never wrote a thread.java. So these are basically, they can help you in some fashion 
But you'll see here as I scroll down, this one says input stream must not be null. Something image.java. I didn't write that, but we're getting closer. Here it's my stopwatch.java. So this is my class. So when you get the red wall of death, the way to fix it is to look for a class that's yours. All the others you can ignore. Here's my class. These are actually links. So I can click on it. So if I click on my stopwatch.java, this is the line of code that crashed. You'll see it's looking for shakeit.gif. If I come over here, I don't have a shakeit.gif. And that's why my input stream is no. So it cannot be no. Okay, so I can switch this over. Let's say I do my Giphy. Okay, if I do my Giphy.gif, run it again, no red wall of death. So if you get the red wall of death, look for files that's yours, and then see what happened with that file. Now, I'm running something here. Let's see, did anything pop up? Okay, nothing popped up. So I'm going to close this. Let's see, here it is. It's way in the background. Let's see if I can bring it over here. Okay, here it is. Nothing popped up. I want my image to be displayed. You got to connect the image view with the image. So if I just pick one, let's say dial image view. I need to set the image. Okay, you'll see set image as a method. And I'm going to put the only image that I have, which is test. Let's see if this works. Okay, it should work. Not sure why it keeps going over there. And here's my Giphy. Okay, it's my Dabasaur. So my data source being displayed, I had to do image into the image view. Make sure you remember that. It's very important. JavaFX, it's similar like I have the stage, the scene, and the scene graph. I have these three layers. Same with the image view. I have the image file itself, but if I want it to be able to be displayed, I have to put it in the image view. Okay, then I can get my data source to be shown. So if I'm making the stopwatch, we can get rid of this test image. And now I'll have dial and my hand image. So if I want to display my dial image, I'll put it in the dial image view. And if I want to display my hand image, I'm going to put it in the hand image view. Okay, so now if I run this, okay, it keeps coming up over here. Here's what I got. So here's my stack pane. Okay, so it's like a stack of plates. I put the dial image view first, and I put the hand image view on top of it. So when I run it, you'll see the hand image view is indeed on top of the black tick marks. Okay, some red messages here, but no red wall of death. So it's working. Now, how do I want to get this to rotate? Okay, so we need that animation. Okay, we need that animation. Now, it doesn't really matter where you put it. I'm just going to put it right after the image views. We'll clean up this code here in a little bit. So to create an animation, I need a timeline. Okay, I need a timeline and I need each keyframe. Those are gonna be my tick marks. Okay, so I'm gonna create a timeline, just like I'm creating an object. Declaration, instantiation, initialization. So here's my timeline. Each timeline needs individual keyframes. Now you can write these together. So I can literally put the keyframe inside the constructor here. Okay, each timeline you need to initialize with keyframes. So I can put it in the constructor here, but I'm gonna separate them for this lecture, just so we can see that we have two elements that make up a timeline. 
Okay, so I'm going to make the keyframes separate out here. Okay, so I'm going to have my keyframe. Now, keyframe requires two parameters. One is the duration, and one is a method that's going to be called at that duration. Okay, so let's say I set the duration in milliseconds to 1,000. Okay, 1,000 milliseconds is going to be one second. And I'm going to use a lambda here. We'll talk about lambdas here in a little bit. Okay, it's going to be this arrow. So if I write it all in one line, this is what it's going to look like. We're getting an error because we have the wrong parameters here, but you'll see this weird parentheses arrow to a bracket. Okay, we kind of talked about it a little bit in one of the previous lectures with the event listeners. It's the same type of information here. At every one second, this method is going to be called. Kind of like the event listener for a button. Whenever you click the button, that corresponding method is going to be called. If I put action event here and then give it a name, let's say event, you'll see the error goes away. So at every 1,000 milliseconds, every one second, this method is going to be called. What do I want to do? For now, I'm just going to do a system.out.print. And I'll just say timeline event. Okay, the timeline requires keyframe to be passed as a parameter. So you can see my two parts are very clear now. So I have my keyframe. A, a new keyframe is going to be created every 1,000 milliseconds. And when it's created, this method is going to be invoked. So if I had a picture, if I had a rectangle, I can move the X, I can move the Y, I could change the colors, exactly what we were talking about in the slides. Okay, if I run this, you're not gonna see anything moving. Okay, and you're not gonna see anything printing out either. Just because I create the two pieces that I need doesn't mean the animation is actually started yet. Okay, you have two additional requirements. Okay, this would be good quiz questions here. So not only do you have two requirements to make a timeline you have or an animation, you have two requirements to make an animation. You also have two requirements to start it. The first is you have to set the cycle count. I can, I can say, play this 10 times, play this 100 times. Let's just try 10. And the second requirement is you got to call the play method. Okay, so if I close this previous program and run it again. Okay, you'll see it's running. It ran 10 times and now it stopped executing. Or I can tell it to just keep running forever. If we have a stopwatch, we may want this to run forever. So I'll do animation and I'll put indefinite. Okay, and that's how we make our animation. Now we don't want this to just print. On the next challenge, you actually need the stopwatch to move. I actually need to stop watching doing it. So I clicked play. I changed it to indefinite. Okay, you'll see it's going to print out indefinitely. But I want this clock to move. So we need to start looking at methods available. So here is my dial image view. And I have my hand image view. You will probably not ever access the actual image files itself. You create the image files. You put them on the views. And then if you ever want to update the element, you're going to update the view, not the actual image file itself. So if I were on a challenge and Professor Wergley's is asking me to move this dial image, I'm going to see what methods I have available. I'm not going to do anything from scratch. So I'll do dial image view. 
and I do the dot notation, I would just let it sit here for a second and let's see what methods we have available. Okay, so these contains, disabled, we have fit height, fit width. We can get data, get image. Usually you wanna look at the setters. You can get X, get Y. Okay, on mouse events, so you can do click events. You can scale. You can set the preferred height and width. You can rotate property. This is getting interesting. Okay, so you can set. You can set image, set height. Here's a set on rotate. Set smooth. Set X, set Y. Okay, so it all depends on what method to use. You can set scale X, set scale Y, set scale Z. Okay, so you can apply different ones. We're actually going to be using set rotate. It's not in bold, but we can read what the method does. So it sets the value of the property rotate, defines the angle of rotation about the node's center, measured in degrees. So the the double value that's passed is going to be degrees. This is used to rotate the node. So if I'm implementing this, the first thing I would do is, okay, I found the set rotate method. And I'm going to try to use it. Maybe I create some variable. Int x equal to zero. And inside here, I just say, okay, I'm going to do x plus plus. That'd be pretty simple. I try this, I get an error, what does it say? Local variables reference from lambda expression must be final or effectively final. Well, if I make it final, it's always gonna be zero. So I don't want it to be final, but it just says local variables. It didn't say anything about global variables. So if I take this int x and make it a global variable, you'll see it turned green. And now if I look, the error is gone. Okay, so this would be the simplest thing to do if I were doing the challenge by myself. I get it to run. Okay, you'll see I actually did the wrong thing. I did dial image view. So you see it's rotating, but the actual dial is rotating, which actually may be a pretty cool stopwatch but we actually want the hand image view to rotate. So let's switch that up. So if I do hand image view, set rotate, run it. Not sure why that goes in the background every time. Okay, you'll see it's twisting, but it's not on the tick marks. So if you've taken my 2830 class, you know, one rotation around is 360 degrees. Two rotations is a 720. Okay, so if you ever do skateboarding or BMX, we always talk about 360s. So 360 is one rotation. I have 60 tick marks. So each tick mark should be six degrees. Okay, so write that math down. There's 360 degrees with 60 tick marks. So each tick will be six degrees. So I did something like X equals plus six. It may look a little bit better. Close the old, pro old program, start the new. To be highlighted in green, I made this global variable up here at the top. Sorry, I keep having to do that. For some reason, this keeps going in the background. And now you'll see I am on each tick mark. Okay, so I'm plusing six. It's exactly on the tick. And it's moving like a regular stopwatch. So I didn't add very many lines of code to make this work. I added 10 lines of code and I get a basic stopwatch. Now, we're going to rewrite this 
because we want the formula to work. This is just a basic formula to get it to work. Okay, the formula we're going to be using for the challenges is a little bit more complicated. That way we can customize our stopwatches. Uh, let's see, what about git rotate? No need for global variable. Git rotate is fine, but it would just get the rotation. I wouldn't be able to modify it. So if I do git rotate, it's those are your getters and setters, basically. So if I do git rotate, I could get the current rotation. Maybe I could add six to it. Okay, that may work. Uh, but let me show you this new formula. Okay, this is the formula that we're going to be using. So we're going to have some variables here. Let's do private. Okay, here's the new formula. You want to write this down. We're going to be using this for the challenge. We're going to have seconds elapsed, which is equal to zero. Okay, we're going to have another variable called tick time in seconds. Okay, which is going to be set to one. This tick time in seconds is going to be how to change the resolution of the watch. We'll take a look at that a little bit later. And then what we just saw was each rotation needs six degrees, but that may be different on different watches. So for now, our angle delta, and we could do it per seconds. Okay, you'll see my variables are getting long, but that's okay. That's better than writing comments will be six. Now these are all doubles. So I could put 0, 0.0. I could put 1.0 here. I could put 6.0. But even if I just put 0, 1, and 6, they will default to point zeros. Okay, so whichever one you prefer. And our formula is going to be different here. Okay, these are all class fields. Okay, so they're class fields, so they're all global, so you should have no problem accessing them inside of our animation. Okay, so let's take a look at this new formula. So the new formula is going to be this. So we'll do seconds elapsed. Seconds elapsed is plus equals the tick time in seconds. Okay, so this is going to be plus one for now. So we're adding one to each of them. And then we're going to calculate a rotation. Now I'm using a local variable here to do this. I technically don't need a local variable. I could put it right into the set rotate. But what's nice about creating the variable is it will lead to less documentation by putting a variable called rotation it's easy to determine what it's doing which will be seconds elapsed multiplied by our angle delta which is our six degrees and i'm going to put rotation inside our set rotate okay now that's pretty self-explanatory i'm setting rotate on the hand image view with the rotation that we calculated. And here's the new formula. So let's see if this runs. Okay, block your view for a second. Keeps pop, uh, popping up in the background. Here it is. Okay, so you'll see it also works. I got the variables up here at the top, so I got rid of that X. And now here's my new formula. Seconds elapsed plus equals tick time in seconds. Rotation equals seconds elapsed times angle delta. And then we're going to set the rotation to the rotation that we calculated. Now, tick time in seconds is going to be our resolution. So right now it's one. So you'll see our hand image view is jumping from each tick mark. Let's say we wanted this stopwatch to be nice and smooth. Okay, so let's say we wanted it to be nice and smooth. We didn't want it to jump between each tick mark. We wanted it to move uh, smoothly across the display, no jumping. 
we could change this tick time in seconds. Okay, that's the whole purpose of tick time in seconds is to make it either jump or to make it smooth. Okay, we could see that. Let's do a quick test. I need to modify this though on our duration. It's multiplied by our tick time in seconds. Hopefully this will work. So if I change this, let's say instead of uh, 1.0, let's say I put it at 0 0.01. Okay, let's say I put it at 0 0.01. So instead of each second adding one, I'm going to be adding 0 0.01. And it's also going to modify the duration of our keyframe to be quicker. So if I close this, make sure you put this in the parameter for that keyframe. Block your view for a second. Now you'll see the stopwatch is smooth. It's not jumping from each tick mark. It's moving nice and smooth and going across the display. So that's why I mean by it changes the resolution. So if I want it to move fast, I can make it move every one second. If I want it to move slow, I need to increase the duration, but then I have a nice smooth stopwatch, which is actually a requirement for the current challenge. So I'm giving away some answers here. One of the requirements is to make your stopwatch smooth for the current challenge and here's the solution. So let's keep building this up. Okay, let's keep building this up. So what do I need for my challenge? Okay, I'm basically going over the solution here. So you wanna write this down. For the challenge, I may need to be able to have some methods like start and stop, maybe reset. Okay, maybe reset. Okay, so it's normally good to actually define these image views. Right now we're just in the start method. We may need access to these image views in other methods that we create. You probably will have a start stopwatch method. You'll probably have a stop stopwatch method. Okay, you could create another start method, but you see there's one already created with that name. So you may wanna say, start stopwatch to make it more clear. Another thing is you can make a separate class. Maybe you make a, a, a analog or a digital stopwatch class and put all of your methods there instead of having all the methods in the main. That'll usually be bonus work for the first one and it will be required for later challenges. So if you were to separate this code into a different class, that would be the way to go because when you go to the next challenge, you'll already have most of it completed. But there's a few things you'll need in other methods. Usually it's gonna be the timeline. So you may wanna define the timeline up here. You may also need the keyframes, or sorry, the uh, image views. So we can create our image views globally. maybe our dial image view and maybe our hand image view. You may need other variables globally. We'll start out with these at first and maybe for your challenge, you need to add more. Notice they're all private, so I'm doing data encapsulation. Now we're just in the main class at this time, but if I had my separate class, I'd create them private as well. And now to switch these, I don't need these local variables anymore. So I'll basically just get rid of the type. So I created my image views up at the top. If I want to change this to global, get rid of the type here. You'll see it turns green. Get rid of the type here. You'll see this turns green. Get rid of the type on my timeline. You'll see it turns green. You'll notice when I needed the timeline, uh, sorry, you'll notice after I created the keyframe, I just put it in the timeline. I don't really need access to the keyframe anymore, but if I needed access to the keyframe, I could make it global as well. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm making these all global. I may need access to the timeline because you'll see here a timeline. I can play it or I can stop it. So I may need access to it later. So let's create some buttons here. Okay, let's create some buttons. So underneath the image views, I'm going to try to keep things together. So here's my stack pane. Here's all my image views, all the code for it. I'm going to try to keep that together. Try to organize the code a little bit. I'm going to create another group for my buttons. And I'm going to put my buttons, let's say, in an H box. Okay, I believe for the challenge, you may need them in a V box. So I'll use an H box just as an example. And let's say in this H box, okay, we're, we're writing a bunch of code today. This will really boost you for this next challenge I'm about to post. We're going to create two buttons. We're going to have a start button. Okay, I'm going to have a start button called start with this text on the button, the UI. I'm also going to create a stop button. Uh, let's see, could we also make the images global? We could. The images we probably will not access again. Once I put the images in the image view, I probably will not change these images, although I could. If you were going to change the image, like let's say um, you load hand.png, and then later you want to put another image in the image view, you may need access to this image file so you can re, uh, reset it. Or I could even just create the image file as a parameter here. I don't need to save these images to variables. I could literally put this new and then actually put it here in the parameters. But I would say once the images are created, you probably will not need access to them again. You'll probably just change the image views once the images are actually loaded. Now you'll see on the previous um challenge you didn't want to modify the buttons you wanted to let the ui take control to to define the size so we'll do that here too max width okay max width set it equal to double max value basically just setting the width as large as possible let the ui determine how large the buttons will be. Okay, so I got two buttons there and they're in an H box, just like we did before. So for the H box, I'm gonna set the alignment. That's the purpose of the H box to change the alignment different then the default alignment buttons are usually at the bottom. But for your stopwatch, you can define them even at the top. Okay, you can define them at the top. I call this controls button. I guess I should call them button controls. Add your S should work. Maybe set some spacing. Okay, set spacing. Maybe I want to space the buttons to 10. Could also set some padding. Last one. And then I'm going to add them to the display. Okay, 25 pixels all the way around. So 25 pixels on the top, right bottom, and then left. Now we're not going to see these. It's just like the image view. So if I have an image and then I have my image view, I need to connect the two. Same with this H box. So first, I need to add the buttons to the box. So I'll get do a get children. 
and then I'll do an add all. And I'm going to add the stop button on the left, start button on the right. That's usually a common practice to do. You're not going to see them. I then also need to add them to the root. So I do a root.getchildren. And then I'm going to do add my control buttons. I guess I should say button controls. You'll see some import issues there. So I can do a control shift I or a command shift I. You notice the insets is the wrong import. It says java.awt.insets. Remember, all imports will be JavaFX. So make sure it starts with the keyword JavaFX. So you do a control shift I, bring up your imports, click OK. It should run. Hey, block your view for a second. Now notice I'm on a stack pane. That may not be the best UI root element. Maybe the root is a grid pane, or maybe it's a VBox. And then inside the grid pane or inside the VBox, I have a stack pane. You can nest elements. So maybe the root is a grid pane and I have one column, three rows. In the top, I have my title. In the middle, I have a stack pane. And in the bottom, I have an H box with my buttons. Okay, so maybe stack pane is not the best element for the root in this scenario because they're all gonna be stacked on top of each other. But that's not the main focus here. Let's try to get these buttons to work. Okay, so if I want the stop button to work, I'll do a set on action. Okay, we're writing a lot of code here. You can reuse a lot of this code for the challenge. Set on action is an action event, just like the keyframe. You'll see the keyframe is also an action event. The button click is an action event. Okay, they're both the same. When this event happens, this method is going to get called. They're both event listeners. So this is what it looks like on one line. I'm setting the action of the button. So whenever you click on it, this method will get called just sitting there waiting. It's sitting there waiting until the buttons click. Okay, so if I run this, set on action. We can take a look at the timeline. This is why I made it global. You probably create another method in your challenge. So if I do timeline and do the dot notation, we can see what we have. So we have gets, we have stop. Look what stop does though. It says stops the animation and resets the playhead to its initial position if the animation is not currently running. Normally with your stopwatch, if you go on your phone, you'll have start and stop, but stop is more like a pause. And then you can reset and it'll start it back to zero. So I may not want to use stop here because it resets the playhead back to its initial position. You'll see I also have play, which we've already used before to start this scene. You'll see I also have pause. Pause pauses the animation if it's currently um, running. And then I can start it up again from its initial position. So this is more of what you want to use for the challenge. You'll use pause and not stop. When you call the reset button, you may do timeline.stop. Okay, we're getting close on time, so let me copy and paste this. So if I do start, I would do timeline.play again. And now that we have buttons, we may not want this stopwatch to begin automatically. Okay, we may not want this to begin automatically. We may want it to only begin when I click the start button. So I can take that automatic play out. So let's see if this runs and then I'll get attendance. Okay, so a lot of code here. 
but hopefully this will get you enough information to at least get started. Next class, we'll fix up these event listeners. There's a better, better way to implement them. And we'll also fix up the UI. And we'll also separate into a separate class. So if I click start, you'll see my stopwatch begins. If I click stop, You'll see it pauses. I have a smooth display, so it could, it could pause in between seconds. But if I click start again, you'll see it begins from the current location. It didn't start over. So be careful using the stop method. If I had it jumping from tick mark to tick mark, it would stop right on the tick. And then if I start it up again, it would begin. Now look how I'm using the stack pane. This hand image view is going to go underneath the buttons here. Okay, so this is not a good root element. You want to use either a grid pane or a VBox and actually separate the components of this UI. But hopefully you get the idea. So there's two things that I need. I need keyframe and timeline. Keyframe is each tick mark. So at every one second, or at every 10 milliseconds, which we just changed it to, rotate the hand image view. Then I have buttons to control the timeline, to pause, or to play, or to reset. We'll try to code that next time. Okay, and this is the idea of the next challenge. We're going to make a stopwatch. Okay, there's the attendance keyword. Put your name and pop it in on the chat. Okay, name and pop it in on the chat so I can get you for the attendance. We're out of time today. I'll post the challenge here in a little bit. Okay, I'll post the challenge here in a little bit. We're kind of doing a Monday to Saturday thing. I would like to get back to a Sunday to Friday, but that's okay. We've had some holidays happening over the weekends. We had the Super Bowl, then we had Valentine's. So we'll do one last Monday to Saturday. And then hopefully this coming weekend, we can get back to Sunday to Fridays. Okay, stay warm. It's cold out there. Post the challenge later on today. Get an uh, early start. Okay, I also have my office hours later on if you need to talk to me. This should be enough knowledge to get started. Okay, you can at least get started. Start building your UI. Start getting the stopwatch to move. Start creating some buttons. Organize the buttons better than what we have here. And then get your stopwatch to at least look and function. Next class, we'll go over a little bit more, which will help finalize all the material that you need to know for the challenge. Okay, if you have any questions, I'll stay here for a few minutes. Otherwise, we'll see you next time.